someone who does this in the club? <laughs> 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 Can you tell me what is so appealing, perhaps, about walking as a dance? So not even really even doing anything, just walking around to the beat of the music. It's an empowerment. Empowerment. Like you were talking about, like obviously a lot of, you know, especially if you're queer, like person of color, anything that isn't a cis straight white male, um, you know, you have to empower yourself. The world fucking is your for you. So, why not walk? Why not walk, indeed. <laughs> right? And yeah. I think it's because, like, um, like you're saying, like, if you're not um, part of, like, the majority or whatever, then even just, like, a simple walk to, like, buy a sandwich can be something that's actually very difficult. Yes. To be able to walk with that much intent and do something that's so, um, <coughs> like, normal and general, but kind of maximize it and augment it is, is like, it's really powerful. Others? I think a lot of the time the the runway will create like a, a juxtaposition between if, if your face is kind of like um, when, when models walk on the runway their faces are not very mobile, but the bodies are very stylized, it's very it's it kind of forces you as someone looking at them to focus on that and there's this um, like indifference to it that you're walking in a way which you command attention but like you don't really care. You know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's like it's like it comes it's almost like it comes actually yeah. like and you were saying that you're playing the space? <laughs> um, right. Oh. So, okay, sorry. This is supposed to be a map of the New York City system, but I forgot to put it in. You can imagine what it looks like. You've seen it, like the, um, the, the subway system. Um, and what I was, the, the, what the image is supposed to convey is that this thing of walking around, so even more to the So thinking of like, how does the catalog transpose itself when it's not uh, say in a ticketed fashion event or a, a place where there's you know, you're there to see the performance, but when you're walking around, and um, this is for me what I would call like the urban catwalk or an urban catwalk, where you're sort of outside and it's still you're still performing, but you're like on the street doing it, right? And this is where street style and street fashion images um, are interesting and play a role. Um, they're almost always about the street itself, so it's about like not only does it look interesting, but it's also because it's embedded in the streetscape that actually is what makes it kind of pop, right? The street as like the studio. And we think that street fashion images, so whatever your favorite tumblers might be for street fashion, or, you know, I mean, classically there's places like the Sartorialist or Street Keeper or during Fashion Week, any of the global fashion weeks, there's always a blog post somewhere about street fashion outside of XYZ's show. And it's like, ooh, what are the looks? What's going on, right? And it's always about... <coughs> But actually, this thing of street fashion has quite a history. Um, this is a painting by the American um, Ashcan school artist John Sloan. It's called Sunday Afternoon in Union Square. It's from 1913. And um, what I love about this painting, sorry, I think well, what I love about this painting is um, that these women here in the front are walking around and they're clearly playing around. They are in their newest looks. The way she's dangling this, uh, the one in the white, dangling this purse out here, just so, so you can see, so you can catch the label dog. <laughs> um, and she's the only, uh, the one with a kind of parasol is the only one wearing purple, which makes me think that this must have been a daring color at this, this moment. All the other women are sort of in white, but she's like, ooh, she's in purple. And you can see the women here um, on, the, on the side are kind of gossiping, maybe even, <gasps> talking about how scandalous she is in this purple dress, oh my god. Um, and so that, irrespective of what's going on in the painting itself, the fact that it shows us this thing of fashion, how fashion interacts with the urban environment, busy urban space, um, gets at this thing of like how we have always been interested in what people are wearing. And 
captured now. Uh, fast forward to the 1980s, and you get an image like this from Jamal Shabazz, who documented um, street kids in Harlem and the Bronx uh, in the 1980s, and still does it now. Um, uh, but just showing you the way that people dress in the street and how it's about um, you know, community building and how it's about uh, just self-expression. This is an example of what I would call one of the earliest examples of a catalog. Now, you've already seen this image here um, earlier when I was talking about Medlin and how he kind of gave us conspicuous consumption. Um, this is the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Uh, it first emerged in New York in 1893 as just the Waldorf Hotel. And it was the sort of ground zero of luxury and hotelry in the United States. The first place to really have that kind of thing. The hotel was so successful that they um, added this added an addition, sorry. Uh, yeah, they added an addition called the Astoria. And it called, became the, Wal the Waldorf Astoria Hotel with a thousand rooms. And it was just really opulent. This is what Bevan was writing about. It's a really opulent thing. And you would arrive in your horse-drawn carriage here. You can see like the entrance there. And you would enter through here. You can see the door on the way back with the two kind of eyes in the back. Um, and this alley was called Peacock Alley. And people, ladies who lunch, people who were sort of note, would sit on either side and would just watch as people came in from their carriers, who is who, you know. And I mean, this is, for me, one of the, one of the kind of quite early example of the catwalk um, as a space where you're peacocking. I mean, the place was called Peacock Alley, right? <laughs> Which was actually the name of the restaurant that this led to. Um, but just to show you that like, the idea of the catwalk as a space of performance and of display and of commentary is something that is um, quite rooted in, in, in history. Um, so I guess I'll now throw it back out to you and ask, what do you think the catwalk does? What does it en enable as a performance space that, say, perhaps other performance spaces maybe don't allow? What does the catwalk facilitate? The yeah. expression yells, enhance one's sexuality, and express their sexuality better. Because as opposed to being, let's say, in the public, there are many people, but you are on catwalk, it's your time, just you. So you can express your sexuality however you want, with your attitude, with what you're wearing, and how you walk in, develop an expression of one's sexuality after. Mm -hmm. So this thing of like heightened um, sense of self, maybe? Yeah. Others? Thoughts on what the catwalk does or doesn't do as a performance space? I mean, I was the opposite. I mean, it, I'd say it can remove all sense of self, because then you don't choose the push you if you're normal. Um, someone else you're walking for someone else, but I just think it, it offers a sense of like high prestige and high glamour and more power, um, but perhaps less self. And I guess that's where the street cap comes in. This where you have both. You have this empowerment of the self and also the glamour. Right. So you're you're saying about like being on like a, like a like this kind of commercial yeah. space maybe is not as liberating as say being on the street. Yeah. In some I think it's all about how you take it because if this is a like a catwalk for like you know the typical fashion industry, then it's just like they're going to your song. But the models are looking at it, it's just the clothes they're selling, and in a way it's um, almost more attractive than liberating. But if this is like like Blue Pulse Black Race, I think it's an immense liberating thing because there's a sense of when you're a minority, you're either fetishized or you're sort of demonized and dehumanized. So for you to own it and for you to treat every step you take as almost a performance, it's um, subverting a narrative. It's a very strong already. Yeah. I think high fashion can be just as liberating as sharp rates in a lot of ways. So I feel like, like it's exactly like the video we watched earlier. I actually I know exactly what program you're talking about, full frontal fashion. Yes. On fashion TV. Um, <laughs> Somebody did their homework. 
Um, yeah, I think it's the same thing. But it's the kind of thing that, especially, like, like we've been talking about the whole time, like, if you're queer, if you're a person of color, you know, by seeing these different figures, these powerful figures, seeing all of the colors, the creativity, it just, it's like a very creative performance arena, and then you'll be able to take this and create your own looks, create your own art, and put your own spin on it. Yeah. So, that, yeah, the, the high that fashion does have uh, maybe some yeah. reclaiming, reclaiming characters. Yeah, exactly, reclaiming it. It's like, there will be some, like, poor queer kid that's gonna, like, take that $5,000 look and do it better. I think um, the I think that this kind of thing can actually be way more liberating because it's like you get the performance but without having to explain it. And I think definitely like you know, if you're like walking down one of those catwalks then you can be really, really expressive. But you know, if you're walking down the street wearing something very, very expressive then people will kind of want answers and the looks will be unsolicited, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, and whereas in this kind of arena, it's like, um, you can get all of the attention, but with um, the complete kind of safety of knowing that like, you are just on a catwalk doing a job. You're so moved. Yeah, so it's like, I think the sense of anonymity and the fact that it's just like your body, rather than like necessarily your mind, it's like, you get, you get to be proud and expressive about your exterior without having to necessarily put any of your mind or soul into it. And I think that can be more empowering, actually. Um, okay. So I want to show you um, an example of, so we've also ourselves done a bit of walking as dance and talked about um, you know, a bit about the catwalk and that kind of performance space. But I want to show you what this looks like when it's um, on TV. No, not fashion TV, but um, on Soul Train, <laughs> which <laughs> uh, was a television program that ran from 1971 to 2006 um, that was really sort of like, you know, um, The Voice or Pop Idol or these kind of seeing how it shows, these variety shows, but you danced, and you danced the latest black music, R&B, um, jazz, funk, gospel, um, created by Don Cornelius and rooted um, in Chicago, which of course has its own history with, um, uh, with black music. Um, it was a show that was based in Chicago, but that was syndicated nationally. So, um, so what would happen is like, yeah, the show was, you would have a catwalk, people on this side, people on that side, making a soul train line, and someone will come out and walk down the middle of their thing, and then they would just kind of repeat. So I want to show you um, just a little bit so you can kind of see what this looks like. And this is one of my favorite clips from Soul Train. Yes. 
and shoulder pads. Come on, pops. I love it. These was the first skins. Do it. <laughs> yes. Look, mom in the back on the left is anxious. Your time don't come on, dude. Hold up. And I'm just going to the talk for the summer. Ah. Come on, mom. Ain't been to a single dance class. But down on leg warmers. So. <laughs> Now this is me, leather paintings, rhinestones all over the shoulders, just all kind of good hands, y'all. you look at this baby? Yes. She got that new vigor on her body, body, bang, here it's gone. But why these boots? She looking for this gold show. I love it. Come on, this gold, come on, give us Michael. Yes. Y'all gonna see some of this stuff on me this summer. I'm going to the door shop. Come on, Tina Liggins. I love it. That is two carrots. Oh, hey, man. David Allen I love Um. So instead of me telling you, I'll ask you, what do you think about what the voiceover adds to the already, like, the pleasure of already watching the dance? What is that voice add to the, to the thing? Humor. Humor, yes. <laughs> a little shade. Hmm? A little bit of shade. A little bit of shade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I had a little bit of like community and when I get like support, you know, like whatever is going on on that kind of week, like yes, I'm going to go for it. For me, this video, uh, the voiceover in particular, rings especially um, powerfully because of the the unabashed like black queerness and the black gay American gay slang that's all up in it, um, and so um, that you then hear in places like RuPaul's Drag Race, it then get hashtags, it then become like showing you how language moves around, starts in one place and moves around, um, and if you're curious, you can go to his website, DorellJHuntLovesYou.com, and buy the t-shirt. Come on, pumps. <laughs> <laughs> the Soul Train Line was already a space where fabulous dancers of color worked a look and their dance moves on the catwalk, an early example of the catwalk as this kind of peacock alley uh, for identity, creativity, and personhood. But as I was saying, what I love about the video is, and about his commentary is that he uses the specificity of black queer language to make the already queer space of the Soul Train dance line even more black and queer. Right. When Beverly Johnson, the first African American model to appear on the cover of American Vogue, worked at the catwalks in the 1970s, she transformed the room with her elegance. She was giving you a fantasy. Through movement, makeup, and accessories, Models draw you into their world, and it's this sense of imagination and worldliness that has always interested me about the performative possibilities of the runway. So, the catwalk is a space that's used to sell garments, as, as, as we've seen here, to get editors and magazine editors and <coughs> buyers and stores and whatever to buy clothes, to then put in magazines and to sell. But when you're brown or queer or marginalized, I think that the catwalk is doing something else. When you, I'm interested in how the language of like this, yeah, the language of this, this world, what happens when it actually becomes a black, a definitely black queer space.
Also, the audience being more comfortable, Same more thing. the audience being more comfortable, more participating in like this whole fourth wall is sort mm -hmm. of broken now. Yeah. So the fourth wall is gone. Glorification yeah. of femininity and everyone is applauding um, instead of bullying. Mm -hmm. So it's based on positivity. Yeah. Okay. All this number of so what I'm trying to get at and underscore here is the difference between a catwalk that is about selling car garments and clothes to an industry and a catwalk that's about breaking down the fourth wall, getting the audience involved, creating a positive space, celebrating community, and not being bullied. Um, um, and this is, just to show you, and this is the, um, now the next section of the, of the, of the talk, but about how um, in Voguing and Houseball culture, the, the runway is really, uh, it's really about the runway um, and what you put on the runway, whatever, whether that's the dance moves or um, how you bring the category on the runway. Most people think about voguing go here. Maybe not us, but lots of people. Um, and um, how many of you have seen Paris is Burning? How many, how many have not seen Paris is Burning? Okay, so about half. So Paris is Burning is a documentary um, filmed by um, a Yale grad named Jenny Livingston um, that was that premiered in 1990 to fanfare and shade. Um, <coughs> and it's really the first piece that really documents voguing in ball culture as it appeared in New York in this particular time. So voguing in house ball culture is a community of um, brown, black and, black and Latino, queer and trans people in New York in the 90s. Um, who organize themselves around um, houses or these kind of fami fam familial units um, that have been chosen, and they compete in these um, stylized competitions or balls where they, they sort of um, get dressed up according to whatever the, the goals or the instructions are for that particular category. And it's a space of self love, it's a space of positivity, and it's a space of um, celebrating black queerness. And this is what Paris is Burning documents. Um, interestingly, Paris is Burning comes out in 1990, but also um, Judith Butler, uh, her book Gender Trouble, also comes out in 1990. Um, and Supermodel, but a work by RuPaul, comes out two years later, 1992. So there's a lot of <coughs> conversation happening already about gender in the pop culture in, 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 in a lot of ways. Um, you should see this documentary called The Queen. And it really tells you the sort of story about how balls were first started in New York. Um, so you may know that the U.S. had extreme racial segregation um, to the well, yeah, not just extreme, but like really a lot. Um, <laughs> um, but but to the point that um, you couldn't participate in the Miss America pageant if you were a black woman. You couldn't be in it um, because of segregation. So the NAACP created something called the Miss Black America pageant which actually was held as a protest um, one year across the street from the Miss America pageant as a way to protest and say, like, you know, what black women do as well. So 
you see these similar debates about black women uh, not being pretty enough to be in competitions or pageants in this documentary, The Queen, which um, is about, which, which follows a kind of drag pageant in, in the 1960s, so the same period as this Miss America, Miss Black America thing. Uh, and if you want to learn how to do some shade, you should really watch this video on YouTube. Just Google, just type in Crystal, Crystal Evasion of the Queen. Literally, everyone write it down. Watch this, watch this scene and you'll see. Because what happened is Crystal Evasion was upset because she didn't win. She didn't win. And so in the middle, when they, when they announced who the winners would be, she stormed off that stage in the middle of the performance. Stormed off the stage, went backstage, and goes on this tirade. And so because she was sick of being treated second, as second class, as a black sort of queen, she created her own house, the House of Levasia, as a way to like compete in these pageants and to celebrate the black queens and to celebrate, um, and to celebrate black beauty. And so then you also have the sense of how and why um, these voting houses, so you have a list of them here. So the House of Cory, the House of Levasia, the House of Pendavis, the House of San Juan, the House of Extravaganza, etc. That these are not just family units, but they're also networks of support. They're kinship networks, right? 